All right, welcome everybody to another edition of Spectrum Cast. Welcome, and this is our Modern Data Protection Spectrum Cast. We have our co-host Randy Arsenal, and we also have Sean, and we have Trisha joining us, and also from across the pond, our uh, competitive expert Fraser McIntosh. Fraser, thank you very much for joining the Spectrum Cast today. That was great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. We, uh, uh, we happen to be doing some, some emailing back and forth with Fraser. We were talking about, I can't remember exactly the topic, and Fraser had brought up an interesting topic that I thought was germane to the kind of topics that we talk about today. And Fraser was talking about kind of the differences between land-free backup, sand-based backup, things, uh, architectures we used to choose in the past versus what we're thinking about as we go forward. And... Uh, you know, Fraser, why don't I just ask you, why don't you give us a little bit of insight as to uh, kind of the evolution of things and how things have been going with, with, uh, with that topic? Yeah, great. So I guess probably around the late 90s, the early 2000s, a lot of the big, typically financial institutions, but a number of the scientific institutions where they had a lot of data, in order to be able to really back that up and you know, some of these systems at the time had nearly 100 gigabytes of uh, data stored. You had to connect them over a fiber channel network direct to a tape drive. And that developed over time. But basically, they made a decision when fiber channel was an order of magnitude faster in terms of bandwidth and probably more than an order of magnitude faster in terms of latency than the currently realistically available Ethernet solutions. And what has happened is that people have really held on to that decision. And you fast forward some 10 years, they were starting to starting to see no a, a de declination in the new entrance into la land free or, or sand based backup. And really to now a good 20 years after it, it really has to be a special use case to justify this kind of expense your ethernet systems are running much faster. I mean, we're even selling ethernet attached tape drives now, which is not something I ever thought would be a, a realistic product. But this is being demanded from us. And we developed it for uh, big data storage cloud hosting providers. But what we're seeing is a lot of our customers saying, well, we really like the container pools. We really like the software defined, the super cheap, get it common off the shelf but we do need that to go via the most expensive possible network we can afford. So, you know, it, it, it's hundreds and hundreds of extra dollars, euros, um, whatever your local currency of choice is, and just for the port in the network. You're maintaining an entirely separate network just to move your data over, uh, just for backups, not, not for your day-to-day -day data transport. And this job can be done in a VLAN, for instance, on your production switches. You don't have to have special networking equipment in your servers. It's much, much cheaper, much less specialist. You can leverage your existing IT security people to check it out for you, for instance. Um, I've always found network people really stray away from fiber channel. So it's really expensive, but the decision has been made. So, you know, we, we do fiber channel backup because we did fiber channel backup 20 years ago. And we've seen this request coming from a lot of the sort of the, the people working at the coalface. So the administrators, the, the designers of the backup and their managers. And how, however, if you talk to actually the people holding the purse strings, they say, well, why do we need to do that if we can do this with Ethernet? What, what's the problem here? And getting those people in the same room when you're trying to make a sale really can focus the attention on driving value for money for our customers. I mean, that's not to say there are no use cases for fiber channel backup. Um, some of these vast Oracle databases, for instance, or DB2 databases, you can really benefit from having a direct attached tape drive, but question why you're doing it. Is it really justified? Do you really need that extra expense? Any other use case that you might think of that might require SAN, uh, Fraser? Yeah, I mean, the classic stand use case is the one that really pervades still, and that's attaching your storage at super speed, um, low latency. But you don't need to do your block storage and your data protection infrastructure on the same networks. 
you really need to separate out these use cases and question which one is worthwhile. Apart from anything, if you are ramping down your use of ports on a fiber channel network uh, for data protection operations, that frees them up and frees up the uh, really very expensive interface cards for day-to-day -day, uh, block storage operations. So it, it saves you all round. So <clears throat> it sounds like it's a way to more efficiently and productively utilize as that very expensive resource, directing it towards production workloads as opposed to leveraging it for secondary and tertiary kind of data protection, which seems pretty sensible as a data protection kind of novice such as myself. That sounds pretty rational to me. I mean, yeah, that's exactly it. Why, why would you pay a vast amount of money and have huge amounts of equipment in your racks to achieve something that you can do with much more freely available common off the shelf products. And it's really about keeping up with, for instance, the existence of VLANs. This is not something you could have done, you know, in the, in the early 2000s. You had to really hunt to get a, uh, a switch with a VLAN. And these days you've actually got to try and spend a, a preposterously small amount of money to get a, a switch without a VLAN. It, it's not an easy task. Trisha, Sean, just a quick question, you know, from an architecture standpoint, Fraser sees a lot. What, what have you guys seen out there as far as some of the evolution from uh, sand-based protection to land-based protection and, and some of the enhancements and, and things we've done in uh, Protect and Protect Plus portfolio to kind of help, help that transition along? <laughs> I was going to say, in the Spectrum Protect portfolio, we have really a common updated, for instance, with deduplication and sending smaller chunks down to container storage pools. And then when we're, um, so that gets the data backed up rapidly. But then when we want to write out to tape, we're moving those to a secondary storage pool, kind of a staging pool, or uh, re-deduping them on the fly and writing them out to tape. So that also kind of helps accommodate these large workloads by deduping them on the client side, just sending over small, small bits, storing those, and then when we do need to write them to tape, using other methods to get that tape speeds up. Sean, you were gonna say? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I agreed with everything Tricia and Frazier have said. I tend to agree, but I think in, in a large part, or just to kind of reemphasize what Frazier already says, in large part, it's a way of thinking that in a decision that was made 10 to 20 years ago, right? Where you kind of looked at the options and based on the technology that was available then, you might only find that SAN uh, or HBAs and switches were the only choice to get done what you needed to get done. And at that point, you made the investment in those technologies. And I think, you know, you come to this modern place now where you have other options and a lot of people are really reluctant to look at that architecture again and, and make the change, so, so, to, so to speak. To, for, to me, it seems like data protection is, is somewhat unique in the sense that, <clears throat> to your point, Sean, the infrastructure decisions that are made and the design, design decisions that are made are obviously based on you know, best of breed and what's available at any given point in time. But because data protection and backup are so sticky and so sort of difficult and deeply embedded in the environment and difficult to change, that, that kind of compounds the problem of rapid growth of data. So it's like, not only do you have this very embedded, very sticky technology and infrastructure layer, you've, you layer on top of that this massive growth trajectory of data and it creates this kind of challenging environment where you know, you're, you're really challenged to maintain a cost-effective um, but compliant data protection strategy. So I think it really gets right to the heart of the, the challenges and within this domain, right? Is those two things kind of converging to create this challenging or very difficult uh, design environment. That, and uh, it seems to be human nature that the bigger the decision you make, the more expensive the decision was to make, the harder it is to reverse that. Or stretch, you want to stretch it out as long as you possibly, I made this investment and I want to get my money's worth out of this investment, right? So I'm going to stretch it out as long as I possibly can. 
And building from that, it's important to assure your customers that you don't have to do it as a big bang. You can gently ramp down your old technologies whilst bringing up your new technologies. Uh, that is essentially the beauty of software defined storage. You don't have to rip out a giant proprietary array and use it to hold your door open with whilst you bring in your block storage to replace it. it it's, it's something that you can blend. Well, and I, I, that's a good I point. I would also, go ahead. Just, just, no, sorry, just quickly though, that what you're describing, that sort of incremental or fractional, you know, progress towards a new environment has, has really only become possible or more possible and enabled by technology within the last kind of 10 years or so, I would say. Is that fair to say? So, you know, it's cool because the technology is adapting to the changing environment of high data growth and very embedded you know, data protection infrastructure design patterns. Um, but, you know, again, if you go back 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't really an option. You kind of had to do the rip and replace, right? So. Yeah, and, and this, the sheer flexibility of um, modern data protection really allows you to do that if you have uh, quality hardware and software available to you. I, I was also gonna add, you can tell me, those of you, you know, everybody else on this call too. One of the other things I think drives this decision is if you separate the backup data over a SAN path from the client directly to the server, you have to a large extent guaranteed bandwidth, right? I have my bandwidth set aside to go from my client to my server and to my backup infrastructure. Whereas a lot of times when people will do it or do do it over TCP IP, they tend to share that infrastructure with other tasks. And for that reason, maybe they don't do a great job of either having enough of the TCP IP infrastructure or prioritizing the backup load. And that tends to, to lead to issues, right? And I think there the problem is not necessarily the technology that you're doing it with, right? It's just making sure that you have enough of whatever technology you do to get the job done. Yeah, I, and I think th this is something that has been a perennial problem, uh, the making sure that your IP networks team is on board and they understand what you're trying to achieve and when you, when you are trying to achieve it. Because like it or not, everyone will talk about backups being able to be run throughout the day, but actually it's relatively rare that companies want to do that. And actually, that in and of itself wouldn't be a problem. It is even rarer that big backbone switches can have blocking ports these days. Typically you'll get full bandwidth between the different ports. So, so, so if you're moving data within a data center, it's going, to, uh, it's going to be okay more often than not. So that brings up a question of where this technology is going. And so we hear a lot about 5G networks, which I always think of as cellular networks, but there's gotta be a lot of technology and a lot of infrastructure put into implementing these. How does that in the end impact our customers or does it? It's very interesting actually. The 5G networks being built out in the UK at least, and I can only presume that this is being replicated around the world, seem to have um, small, edge compute stations, uh, small like data centers at the bottom of the mast. There's one just been built down the road from me and there's quite a lot more whirring at the bottom than, uh, than your standard UK green box where they just patch in the different uh, connections coming in and out. And the local cellular network engineers were saying, yeah, we're, we're running a bunch of rack servers in here. We're pushing tasks out to the edge. So it is potentially that you will need to be running small data protection functions to get the data across the backbone back into the data center. Yeah, that's really interesting. That, that whole kind of um, hub, hub and spoke model um, really is gonna become a lot more commonplace. And in fact, if you look at where all the Apex cloud providers are going with like AWS Outpost and even to a lesser degree, IBM Satellite and others, that's the model, right, is, is developing these location aware, you know, very powerful small data centers on a regional level and then providing that sort of conduit back. And, and you're right, they are pushing a lot more of that workload and a lot more of the data, um, the data proximity or proximal actions like backup, like compression, like, you know, dedupe, like, 
you know, localized pattern analysis and some AI processing and machine learning out into those smaller data centers, which is creating a very interesting set of challenges, I presume, for data protection. But it, it's, it is, it's cool. It's an interesting phenomenon, but I think it definitely, there's still a lot of unanswered questions about how that's going to play out. Well, it's cool. is very much tied up in the acquisition of Red Hat for us as well. You know, the containerization and the orchestration of the containers, the ability to just spin up ad hoc workloads at the bottom of a pole somewhere. <laughs> What's cool about that is, is just, and this is just thinking out loud, how the evolution of different technologies such as data protection, right, kind of evolves as people want to do things like move data uh, from my primary data center up into the cloud and that sort of thing. So, Fraser, one of the things that we like to do is if I'm a customer and I'm thinking about, or I have been thinking that my data protection infrastructure needs to be sand based, right? But I'm probably at some point where, given my, my history of the technology and my environment is, is gonna start to change, what are some of the things I should think about if I, if I wanna stop thinking about this really expensive way of going and, and know that I can be successful when, when I move this forward? Like, how should I think about that? Well, so from the point of view of someone at the coalface, um, you know, the, the designers, I would, um, I, I would think about what I'm doing, what I'm trying to achieve. Really, it's the achieve the best outcome, and that is typically divide, defined per company, but it's usually defined on the basis of you want to be getting X amount of backups and retaining them for a certain amount of time. And then you probably chuck in some reuse and things like that these days. But really, the actual movement of the backup data, think about the infrastructure you've got, think about how much it costs for the power, the cooling, the data center footprint, any extra FTEs that you might need to operate different types of networks, how secure a network might be if your IT security people in-house aren't specifically skilled in it, and then how much the ports cost. So we, we always run into this, we can't do it with Ethernet because it costs too much. And, and it really doesn't. You don't have to make a big bang change. You can do it gradually. You will need to probably get someone, you know, at the top of the corporate ziggurat to make a decision to come down the other side. And this is how I had uh, change affected at one of my previous employers where we had a similar um, problem where we wanted to, the designers wanted to move from RAID 0 plus 1 to RAID 5. And the people who accepted the the designs into production were not keen on that. And they came up with all sorts of arguments like it will cost too much, uh, it, it won't be reliable enough, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. And they're very similar to the arguments that you hear about moving away from SANS to IP networks. And in the end, after a number of um, probably rather more heated discussions than would be strictly professional, uh, the manager who had the common view of both teams found out the cost difference and imposed change. And when change was imposed, everyone normalized it. That is not a desirable situation for an employee to be in, though, is having their senior management impose a change on them where they could have reported up to them saying, look how much money we've just saved. Uh, we have reduced your budget and here's how we've done it. So evaluate the decisions that you've made in the past, make sure they are still valid. It, it's really important. Um, be aware that people have a tendency, and I, I say this having identified this in myself, a tendency to really resist change and try to be aware if you are doing that. Actually back up people. <laughs> I think that's great advice, Fraser. Sean and Tricia, any, anything else you want to add to the conversation? I would just add to what Fraser said and not only looking, so you, because this is such a big decision, really looking at the future of what you think your workloads are going to be and how that'll impact your network. So 
taking into consideration not only the past but the future and then also the whole security network piece and if you haven't already upgraded to Spectrum Protect where we have SSL built in for the communications make sure you get into that version so you are protected. Good advice. Sean? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I would just echo what, what Frazier said and, and add to it that to a large extent, it's also a cost of acquiring expertise. And SAN switches and SAN infrastructure is a very specialized ex expertise, whereas you should have considerable expertise already in your corporation. Most corporations do on TCP IP network. And usually that expertise comes at a less of a cost because it's so common, right? So I would look to that team to be a part of the change, a part of the React architecture, a part of the costing out of the new solution uh, to get you where you want to go. I'm glad you brought that up, Sean. We, we talked a lot about CapEx, but that clearly hits on the, on the OpEx side of things. Um, Frazier, I want to say a huge thank you. I know it's late your time, but your expertise on this call is, uh, is well worth it. And I'm, I'm, uh, I feel this has been one of our our better uh, podcast talking about some real things that customers can grab onto and kind of think about and think about how they can evolve and save money and, and, uh, and be successful in the future. So um, I thank yeah, you very much for I coming. should get think I should get think 40 credit for this because I always learn something on these calls. So I'm going to start lobbying to get credit for these. I think that's a great idea. We should, we should do that. <laughs> yeah. All right, gang, uh, thank you all very much for, uh, for participating today. And uh, as we've said before, you can find us in, in a myriad of places, uh, LinkedIn, blog posts, the, the IBM community network. Reach out if you have any questions or any thoughts. Fraser is uh, obviously an IBMer. He's on our competitive team. Any questions around that side, please reach out to him in Slack or email. And uh, you guys all have a great day, and we'll talk to you next Thursday.